message is the Keteret, the fragrance of prayer. As you know, I teach on the bride and the fragrances of the bride in the Song of Solomon. And there's other fragrances mentioned in the scriptures regarding the priesthood and those that were prescribed for the holy anointing oil and those for the holy incense. And today I want to just take a closer look at those that were for the holy incense. And I believe that you're going to see this to be very interesting as we study this. Now, I've used very different variations of scripture here. So it's going to be a little bit different each time just because I wanted to give you a flavor of how some some say it. But what we're going to begin to look at is the book of Exodus 30, verse 34 through 38. When Yahweh gave the instructions to Moshe concerning how the incense was to be prepared, and he said, take for yourself spices, that tea, myrrh, onica, galbanum, and then there were other specified spices because it mentioned spices, and pure frankincense, equal amounts of each. In parentheses here, it says grind each spice separately and then blend and these were the instructions the rabbis kept concerning the mixing and blending. This was considered the art of the apothecary and how they were to prepare this. Now, so I actually went to a, some websites to get the exact wording of how they would have passed this on through the Levitical tribe in preparation of this substance that they were going to burn before Yahweh. So that's why I wanted to leave these little notes here for you. It says, grind each spice separately and then blend them together as the keteret, the incense compound, the work of a master perfumer. This is the apothecary, okay? Now today, we've lost that understanding of what apothecary is, but in some schools of thought, it's, it was the pharmacist, if you will. He was the one who would dispense the uh, extracts and herbs for medicine. And so that was, in fact, what the priests were doing, as well as compounding a fragrance that was going to be used before Yahweh. They considered this as a perfumer. Now, today we have that art as well. And so this is a big industry today. Every time you go in a department store, you see lines and rows of counters with perfumes on them. Now, it says that these were to be well blended, free of all impurity and holy. Now, they said that pulverize a small portion of this daily and take it and place it on the golden altar before the ark of the testimony in the communion tent where I will commune with you. It shall have the highest degree of holiness for you, Kadash, Kadashim. With regard to the instance you are to make, do not duplicate its formula for your personal use. Okay, you're not supposed to be wearing it like perfume. It must remain set aside for Yahweh. If a person makes it to enjoy its fragrance, he shall be cut off spiritually from his people. And this is what it tells us in the book of Exodus. Now, I'm going to give you another scripture later, and we're going to read it straight from another translation of the King James Version. Now, when Moses received the instructions on how to build the tabernacle, he was told to include this altar in which Aaron, his brother, would prepare this incense, and it was to be burned every morning and every evening throughout all of Israel's generations. How long is that, folks? Isn't that forever supposed to be something that's continual, perpetual? Now, incense is that fragrant smoke that would have come from the substance as it was burning and would have been rising up toward heaven to the throne. And this was, of course, ceremonial picture of what is in heaven. Okay, this is something that's already taking place even now, that the throne of God is in the midst of these fragrances. And so this was on the altar before the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Now, I know you, this is all pretty elementary for you right now in understanding this. I'm sure you all understand this. I just want to give you some background as to where we're going with this. Now, the rabbis teach that the incense was to be compounded and weighed. It would have been 368 manna or man measures, okay? That would be 365 measures for each day. That would have been divided one for half in the morning and half in the evening. 
training. And then there was three measures that was set apart for the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, who would bring this on the holy day of Yom Kippur as a double portion. And then he would, in the evening, prepare again with a mortar to regrind, to continue to make the compound of mixing the incense. Extra fine, they add to that. Yahweh gave strict instructions on how it was to be used in Exodus 30, verse 1, and then we see through 6 and 9. Now, I mention that because I think for the most part, when we see that warning, we just go, okay, <laughs> I won't go near it. <laughs> and then they don't want to look at it. Don't, we don't want to study it. We don't know anything more than, except that we're not supposed to do this. Well, I want to give you some more instruction and a little clarity on that because that's not at all what Yahweh was intending. He was trying to tell us, though, that this was something very important and holy to him not to treat it commonly or profane it. Now, let's look at the book of Exodus again, verse 1, starting in chapter 30, and we're going to also jump down to 6 through 9. It says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning, when he dress the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. Now, that's interesting that this would be the menorahs. There is an oil that's used for those. And so he's giving us a word picture here. It's a prophetic picture of what he's expecting as you bring forth the incense. And so when I, Aaron light the can lamps said evening, he shall burn incense upon it a perpetual incense before the Lord, that would be Yahweh, throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. Okay, so he's given specific instructions on these, each telling us something about why this is so important to him in following his details. Now, Yahweh has provided us with this recipe, which was to be prepared in, we see this in verse 34 of Exodus 30 as well. And the Lord said unto Moses, take unto thee sweet spices, stati, onika, and galbanum. These sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. Now, we've talked about that, I think the last time I was here, I talked about the holy fragrances that he mentioned here, the four that were to be of equal like weight. However, when you look at the those that were mentioned concerning the holy anointing oil, he had specific measures of amounts. So it was different. It's not the same, okay? In the sense of the holy anointing oil, there was a prescription a uh, recipe that couldn't be cut or divided. It had to be prepared all at one time and in the same measurements that he gave. However, in this, it was four equal parts, if you will. It's interesting, when I was studying on some of the websites for pharmacies and such, I, I did a little study and found that it is a very common practice when they are compounding medicines, that there are four equal parts at the baseline of any medicine. And then they add the other ingredients on top of that. So it's interesting that Yahweh set that pattern and that that's something that they still practice today. Now, it says, And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put a, of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. Now, we read that earlier. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. You see, it is for his use and his purpose. So it's not something we can use as a, a common fragrance around the house or burn it at home. What's, whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereof shall be even cut off from his people. We read this earlier again. We're just going over this in a different translation. This is the King James Version. Now, the incense or the keteret contained equal portions of. Now, the rabbis that I was looking at the Talmud and the sages, they said that it was balsam, the nataf balsam. And the reason that they went back to that is their, uh, what they consider it stati to be is because they found some in the Comrade Caves of a uh, 
a little jar, you know, jarlet of it, um, and they were able to break it down scientifically. They they took it apart and discovered that this was balsam. Now we know about the balsam oil mentioned, the healing oil of Gilead as well. But in the King James, we see it's called stati, and then there's others who even say that the stati is in fact myrrh, or at least the bark of the myrrh tree where uh, we see resin also mentioned there. And then we also see the Shekhalet Onika, and, and then we have the Galbanum, which is the... Kelbana, Kelbana. <laughs> I'm, I'm always getting my C H and S H is mixed up, so I gotta look to Mark, get a little help here. And the Levana, which is the frankincense, it would have been pure extract. And so, in some cases in Scripture, we do see incenses, in fact, translated for frankincense. So there were cases where it was just pure frankincense being used here. Now, why did God say it was holy? Why would He consider this? separate and special considering the fact that we do see in other places in scripture frankincense and myrrh used as well as being mentioned again in the new testament where we see when he was a young child yeshua was brought myrrh and frankincense so we know that there were fragrances that were used but however in this case the way that it was measured and mixed and compounded was very holy to God. And so the Hebrew word Kodesh is telling us that this is something very important. It's to be set aside and kept separate because it has the power to sanctify and set apart what it touches. And that was a pretty amazing thing when you consider that. That is why we are called holy. Amen. We've been set aside and are set apart for his use. So that's why we can't mix and mingle with the common ordinary living lifestyle anymore don't you feel like a fish out of water sometimes when you go places and you think what am i doing here why am i here <laughs> are you i don't know maybe if you lose that sensitivity to god in that when you're around unclean things or watching something you shouldn't be watching on television or listening to something you shouldn't be listening to and if it doesn't bother you and you're not sensitive to that then you, know, you may need to recheck and re-examine your walk and wonder what's going on here because i really I think that as we are set apart and realize the holiness of what he wants us to be, you'll soon develop a sensitivity to when things aren't right, right? Okay. When you go into a dark place and you know, ooh, you can feel the demonic oppression in places and things like when you're even in the shopping mall, I mean, you know, in, in movies and such. I think that the reason why Yahweh said this was a holy thing to him because David likened his prayer to incense. In Psalm 141, verse 2, it says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. Isn't that good? So Yahweh was telling us it's holy because it represents the prayer of the saints. And when we look at Revelation, there it tells us in chapter 5, verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You see, that's what it is. That is what the whole idea of this incense is about it represents the prayers of the saints and there you saw the four beasts so the four parts of the measures of these fragrances part of that picture the four faces of Yahweh the four beasts and those that surround his throne we see in this incense that the Torah is very explicit concerning the correct or the punishment the spiritual exertion of being excluded if you were to use this for common purposes, or if you were to touch it concerning the use of it in an improper way, or even those consider what happened. The two stories we see in the Torah, remember the matter of Korah. Remember when Moses told them, okay, you know, after they're complaining and saying, hey, we can do this, right? They said, okay, come on out here. <laughs> Carry your incense on in there and guess what happened to them, right? The earth opened up and swallowed them up. And then the fire came down from heaven because they considered, hey, anybody could do this. You know, you're not so, anything special. Well, I got news for you. That's not true. And so when you hear saints of God in, in the body today who consider, oh, yeah, I got access to the throne. I can go up in there anytime I want to, any way I want to. I'm thinking, no, you cannot. 
You see, you don't realize the holy God that you serve. You can't just show up any way you want and think he's supposed to accept that. That's an unscriptural way of looking at God that you must think much more higher than, your, than he thinks of you because you are to come into his presence in a manner that is holy. And so the high priest is showing us that. This is how to be the bride, to be like the high priest, that we are considered like him. We are a part of the body of Messiah. He is our high priest now. He makes intercession of, on our behalf. So we are to come into his presence in a manner which is pleasing to him, right? If you want to have access to him, yeah, we have access to him. But now it's the manner in which you know, we go in and the proper way to approach the throne of God. Amen. So because of that and their extremely exalted status of the holy incense, it was to be carefully guarded and protected against misuse, which is one of the reasons why the rabbis believe that there were a number of spices that were excluded and not mentioned in the Torah concerning what the proper full picture of it is. In fact, I think there is a, a synagogue that has it written on the floor that anyone who is to give away this would be cut off from the people. And so this is something we have to consider. Our prayer time and the manner in which we speak to Yahweh should be considered the same thing. You see, you can't just recite simple little prayers when you go into his throne room. I mean, I think that he's gracious to us in our beginning growth of maturity when we pray simple little childlike prayers. I don't think that he doesn't listen to those, but I certainly believe that as you and I mature, he does have an expectation of our prayer walk and our prayer life and what we are to bring to the kingdom. You know, when we, we talk to him, you see, because of where you're bringing this is this altar in which the incense was to be burnt. And so you're bringing your prayers before the mercy seat, before the throne of God. And so we're not just to throw up one of those Simple little, it's sort of like when we uh, get in the habit of praying over our food before we eat. You know, sometimes we just do the little, God bless his food and, you know, and thank you for it and kill all the bacteria and germs and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, God. You know, we're talking miracle working when you're going in and eating hamburgers at McDonald's and Burger King. <laughs> when you pray that prayer over that food, because I get convicted every time I do now. I start thinking, you know, I'm really expecting him to do something here with this food that's unhealthy. I already know that. So I'm expecting him to first kill off everything that shouldn't be there. <laughs> You're going to do some real miracle work because you know that majority of our food today is 70% or 80% now GMO, which means genetically modified. So you're talking some real miracle work <laughs> you know, for him to have to recreate everything. I mean, does he? But we've gotten so slap happy with their prayer life that we now think that he's going to do some magic work for us and wave his magic wand and make it all disappear for us. i got to be honest with you. When we've done services for healing in the church and you have a, a line, we're out there for three and a half hours ministering. They come up with heart disease and diabetes and things because they've been eating unclean foods for 45 years, you know, and suddenly they, they want us to fix that. For them, because they don't have the faith to believe it, but it's a matter of choice and lifestyle. It is a, a matter of coming back and restoring Torah in your walk. And so this is a process. So we, we do believe in miracles. I don't get me wrong. I think once you understand the elements and what he's looking for in your prayer concerning how it's to be like incense, you're going to see more prayers answered because it's going to be effective. You're going to know what to ask and what to say because he's given us this answer here. So now that we have access because of the veil that was rented in two, because we have our high priest Yeshua, who was one that was given the atonement, the final atonement for our sins. Now we have the ability to have the audience of Yah in his throne room to pray. And that was uh, Hebrews 9, 6 through 15, if you wanted to go back to that. And so at that precise moment that Yeshua died, that veil that was rent and torn in two signified this major event had taken place meant that we now have access to the Father. Of course, in light of all this, we need to understand what that means. As the broad Messiah, we are acting as the priest. 
We don't need someone else to do that for us. We can now come boldly to the throne of grace. We have access to him. But again, we must honor and understand who we have access to. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16. Amen. And so just as the Levitical priesthood in ancient Israel were given that recipe from which they were to compound this incense, so we as a kingdom of priests have been provided provided with a recipe for the four equal parts ingredients of our prayer life. And so our high priest Yeshua gave us a model for prayer. And again, here you go. This could be a mantra. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Those are good words. I want my children to know these words, but I want you to know too, that it was a model. It was a model. It was not to be here it is. And this is all, you know how to pray. And, and so he's telling us thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In Matthew six nineteen through 15. And you know what? Since I've been studying Torah, I go back and read some of the New Testament things and I go, wow, it's been a long time. You know, I haven't read a lot of these things. Now, this was an example to provide us with a framework or structure for prayer covering those things that are important and pleasing to Yahweh. Who would know better than the creator of the universe? Amen. Who would know better? He was saying, here, you want to know how to pray? Here you go. This is simple. But with this formula that we look back to concerning our prayers, not being a, a vain repetition of the same thing over and over. And I know we've sort of gotten into that habit with the kids praying the same thing. And I listen sometimes and I think, OK, that, that's becoming to be quite trite. Are these kids really learning how to pray? Are they knowing how to go to the throne room when they need an answer? Are they understanding who they're even talking to? Because, you know, I think we're all going to be course on our face and floored when we do come into the presence of Yah and see the greatness of who he is. And so this is considered just an outline of those things that must be weighed and measured. Those things that must be expounded upon those things that we are going to discuss and get an opportunity like Moses did to consider say, but Yah, you know, what about this? You know, remember when he was interceding on behalf of Sodom, he was saying, but what about this? What about this? How about if it was this many people? How about if it was this many people? You know, he had that, that ability to come. Let us reason together, he says. Haven't you ever had one of those conversations with Yahweh? But Lord, <laughs> what about this? You know, I do it all the time. There's times when I wish I hadn't because he goes, okay. And then you realize, okay, that wasn't the best decision. Maybe that wasn't the the highest way to go about it. Now the sages say that the incense making revolved around the ideas of retrieving, refining, extracting, and elevating the sparks of holiness to bring us into that divine place with him. And that it says in ourselves and in the creation at large from the unrefined state in which we were originally received them. So I thought that was interesting because that's very, very similar to what we know from the new covenant and how he's shown us how, this is a makeup of, of, of a well-balanced relationship with God through prayer. If you want to ever take the yardstick out to measure your relationship with God, look at your prayer life. That will tell you what kind of relationship you have with God. How you treat others and how you treat him, right? That's pretty simple. I'm convicted by my own words because my relationship with my husband, I'm always being saying, is that what I think of my Messiah? Is that what I think of my heavenly bridegroom? Because I'm always, you know, upset and, you know, and stirred up about things. I mean, it, it, do I not trust my husband? Do I not trust my heavenly husband? Is he not capable of doing, you know, what needs to be done? And, and do I feel like I have to be a quick fix, you know, got to control everything, you know, to make it happen? Can I not let go and let God be in charge here? <laughs> I happen to believe that sometimes... I'm God. I'm the one who's only, I'm the only person that's going to get this job done, right? I had a friend tell me the other day, she says, Becca, let the trash overflow. Let it go. I says, but you don't understand. I got all my children trained now. They do all the household chores pretty much, you know. I got them well trained in that area. I said, but, but it would, if I was to let the trash overflow, it would be let the ministry go sometimes, you know. Just stop. Just walk away from it and just let it sit. Okay, so things don't happen as fast as you want them to. And that's the part that's, that's where it hurts because you're like, you feel like it's got to be right now. 
But these four spices that were written explicitly in the Torah, it says the Torah, Zori, the balsam, the stati, the myrrh, the onika, the galbanum, and the frankincense, these all that were given to us. And the reason they, the rabbis put this in front because they were drawing a distinction of those spices concerning their status and what they stood for. Now, I'm going to talk about each one and what they are spiritually in the word and how it relates to your prayer life. The first one, the stati, the one that the rabbi said was balsam. Now, stati is very similar to myrrh in that it was a resin that would have been the piercing of the tree or pulling the bark back. In fact, I just read last night online that uh, the stati was part of the bark, and that's why it was a distinguished picture concerning the myrrh. But it was a gum that was excluded from the tree. And I'm going to pass this one around for you to, again, have an opportunity to try. Mark, if you could get that out. And we also, it hardens into droplets called tears. tears. And the stati or the stratus shrub grows in abundance in the lower hills of Israel. And so those tears represent the tears shed in prayer. Remember when Yeshua prayed himself, it says in Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in him that he feared. Isn't that interesting? Yeshua cried out, strong crying, it says. He cried out to Yahweh for help the only one who could save him and remember he said not my will but your will be done he submitted himself he let it happen he allowed God to do his perfect and complete work through him and as we look at this fragrance and smell it you understand that in your own prayer life do you pray with stati do you pray with tears concerning those who are not part yet. There may be sinners in the world who need someone to stand in the gap. Sometimes I pray for people and I wonder if anyone's praying for them. I think, Lord, I know you've put them on my heart. And I know that in my case too, you know, we, we get so sloppy agape, I guess you call it. You go, okay, pray for me. You know, it's almost like a goodbye. Pray for me. But do you? I mean, all right, let's be honest. How many people pray when somebody says, pray for me? Nobody? I don't either. I mean, you know, I'm talking about really pray. <laughs> well, you do when it's an enemy or somebody is trying to attack you. You start praying for that person, don't you? God, bring down judgment. <laughs> Convict them, you know. But do you pray with tears of repentance? I'm going to pass this around for you can see this. Do you mourn for those that are dying around you? I had another conversation with a lady up in Alabama, and she says, I just want this thing to be over. I said, I don't want this thing to be over. I want people to come in. I still see so much that needs to be done. And my heart grieves for this nation. I'm not wishing for judgment to come. I'm praying for mercy. I want to see this nation saved. I don't want to see us go down the wrong path of destruction. I don't see where that's necessary. I think we still have hope. I have hope. I still believe that God can move in this nation. There's enough believers in this room right here. We have a minion. Amen. So we can still do something about it. Why not? When you look at the founding fathers and what they went through and Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death to him. It was a matter of dying for it. He says, hey, I'll, I'll die if, if I don't have freedom and liberty. And I stand with that. I believe that those are part, it's part of my history. I'm from Virginia and we're part of that founding fathers. I'm a daughter of the Confessor and daughter of the American Re Revolution. And our family were one of the richest landowners in Virginia. And they fought to keep the tea from coming down and, and passing through their land. You know, they, they fought for liberty. They stood up for what they believed to be right. And yet both sides were right and both sides were wrong concerning the way things were handled. But Yahweh looks for us to come to him with true repentance and to cry out for those who can even cry for themselves. They don't even know to cry. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, it says in Matthew 5, 4. And so it's with true repentance that we are to cry out for this 
this nation and the people that are lost. Now, for Onika, this is another fragrance that's mentioned in the incense. It is debated concerning whether this was actually from the stratus, a benzoid type of resin from the tree. Some say that's what it was used, a plant resin. Others believe it's an aromatic from the muzzle of the shell because of its Hebraic root. And I'm going to show you that word in a minute. But that would have been what the dye, uh, the blue that's used for tzitzis would have come from as well. Tequilate. And the Greek word onyx also adds some confusion from the Septuagint. And that the onyx is, is, of course, like a fingernail, and you can see the dark color. And then so it has that claw shape look as well. And there's some mix up concerning this. So we can all say it together. I figured I would, I probably should have made my notes more like a karaoke, have them light up for you so you could say it with me. <laughs> Now, this word, the shekelet, is believed to refer to that resin with a nail-like shine. So that's why we have confusion concerning what this actually was. That's why I put all this out there, because you can decide for yourself whether or not you go with what they say in the dictionary for Bible plants or the encyclopedia of Bible plants says, Onika is more likely to be a plant resin. And then Rabbi Gamiel, who was Apostle Paul studied under, believed this was to be a part of the plants. And then those of the other school of thought thinking that it was that little nasty shell muzzle plant or animal that grew. And I tend to disagree with that as well, just because I think that most likely it was of the plant species. I think it makes more sense than using the other animal. But it was highly aromatic and fragrant, and it also has great medicinal properties. And then when you're considering your prayer life, certainly the medicinal properties seems to be the most likely ingredient because of the sacredness of the incense and that we are considering this to be a healing effect, going into prayer and uh, spending time before the Father. We see this concerning the Torah, that there, this is a healing balm. It's for the entire body. And that's who the priests would have gone into the presence of Yahweh on behalf. I mean, he was praying for the body. He was praying for those of Israel. He was standing in the gap concerning that. Now, when we look at our own walk and our own prayer time, do we have Onika in our prayer life? Are we praying for others in that need help? Are we praying for healing for others and having compassion like Yeshua did? He had compassion. It says in the King James Version, Matthew 14, 14, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, that was such a major part of his ministry that today, certainly, he must want us to continue in that part. I mean, more now than ever before, we are seeing a lot of people who are ill and need to be healed. Amen. I really believe we're going to see revival come in the sense of real revival <laughs> when we see people getting healed, right? They'll be coming out of the woodwork to get healed. Wouldn't you? Amen. And Yeshua had compassion on all those who needed spiritual healing. It says, but when he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, Matthew nine thirty six. Well, I certainly see this as a prophetic word because we see that today, that there's just sheep scattered all over and they are lost and they need a shepherd. Amen. And so Yah is bringing them back together. He's restoring the house of Israel. Amen. And that's a healing thing in itself. So it's important for us to pray for the return of Israel to bring back that spiritual healing. And as priests, we've been given the means by which to do that. We have the power in our prayer life, the power of these oils for healing. It is to bring about healing in Revelation 22, verse 2, which was a prophetic word given to us through the vision of John. Concerning those things that had not happened yet, he was writing about the future, and it says, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Well, these are plant extracts and resins that come from trees and plants, and so he's telling us the answer of our prayer is right in front of us. He's telling us this. Now, in galbanum, this is the third ingredient that we see in the holy incense, galbanum, this one is also another one that seems sort of out of place because it is a plant that was found in Syria to Iran, and it belongs to the same family as the fennel, and it has a real sharp bite 
taste or smell to it. I happen to like it. A lot of people think that it's sort of pungent and disagree. You know, they don't like that odor it gives off. I like it. I don't know if that says anything about what I think when I read this part about it. It says this ingredient equates with some of the unpleasant things we need to pray about. (laughs) How about that? That's your reminder right there when you use this oil to remember we're to examine ourselves and to carefully look. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves, whether ye be in faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Yeshua HaMashiach is in you, except ye be reprobates. We're supposed to look at ourselves to give us our own self-examination of our heart and look at unpleasant experiences and say, what are you trying to show me, Father? You know, I had something very horrible happen to me this last week. I mean, I don't think that I've ever had anything affect me deeper than this a demonic attack that came to me through a family member. And because of it, I felt like my insides were being ripped out of me. And I was, a, I was a, a feeling all kinds of spiritual oppression and fear and, and anxiety and everything just coming at me at once. And it was simply just a, a nasty letter that someone had said. It was Lashon Hara, though, you know, see? And, and those words can do a lot of damage when they are spoken from someone in the family who you know and, you know, thought was a loved one, if you will. And so those words deeply wounded me. And I wanted to react. I felt so much pain and, and wanted to react, but I didn't. You know, I said, Father, what is it you're trying to show me? What is it about me? Not to say we always cause the harm or the things that are brought on us, but I wanted to know what are you trying to do? What are you trying to change in me? And simply, that was my heart, was I want to know because I want to be right. If there's something in me that needs to be changed. Remember when David, his men with him, who was the gentleman? That, it was Nepal that would, one the one who was throwing rocks and saying things at him. And David said, don't attack, don't you? Because they're like, you want us to go over there and chop his head off for you, David? He said, no, no, don't do that. Because maybe the Lord will have mercy on me because of that. You know, maybe the God will see fit to have mercy on me. Because maybe something he's saying is true. Maybe I should consider and just sort of read between the lines, between all the hate that's being spoken and read between the lines and say, what are you saying to me, Father? What is it that that I need to look at in my own life? Now, when we look at the Jewish Talmud, it says that the Galbanim, Kelbana, the Kelbana alludes to complete sinners. I thought it was so interesting how the two tie so beautifully together when I was comparing Torah to the new or renewed covenant in the words of how both so beautifully complemented each other and they're both agreeing with one another that this substance this fingernail color that's smooth and unblemished on the inside and yet darkened on the outside in other words i've seen some really worn people who've been through the hard stuff you see in life but yet yahweh is making them a new creature and and a new man in christ jesus he is doing a work and that's always the case it's always on the inside there's something going on maybe we don't see it on the outside necessarily but he's telling us to look inside our hearts this word galbanum is chaleb it means the fat the richest part you know the fat was the portion that yah said was his It wasn't, we weren't supposed to be eating all this fat. You all, of course, all know that as you're studying the nutrition and and, uh, everything that Pastor Charlotte's been sharing with you. Consider this, that even in our prayer life, you see, we are to give him this portion. You realize he wants the worst portion. (laughs) I mean, the fat's the part we're not supposed to eat because it's unhealthy for us. Consider this. He's saying, I want the yuckiness of you. I want the filthy part of you. I want the the part that all ugliness of you. He's saying, that's my portion. When I consider the last several weeks and months that we've been experiencing hardships financially and trying to continue to do ministry, and Mark and I, we compare notes, and I keep going back to the very beginning when he saved me. I didn't go looking for him. He found me. I was a sinner as as far down you could go considering living a horrible lifestyle of sin and drugs and sex and rock and roll and, and idol worship and the whole thing. It, it was yucky from head to toe, you know, and yet that's when he found me and he said, come and follow me. 
it came to me in a dream. And I thought, I, I go, oh, always go back to that because I go, I go, Father, you found me. You found me in the worst condition and said, come. Now, here I am thinking I'm a little bit better off, right? <laughs> I'm not doing that stuff anymore, considering I, th- I feel a little better about myself, you know, when I'm walking in the righteousness of God and I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, all things, right, become new again. I'm thinking these things, but then I'm getting a little prideful with the two, thinking, well, I deserve better than this, don't I, Father? <laughs> and he, I go back to the beginning and go, there was such a grace there when he saved me. See, I didn't do anything to deserve it. Not one thing. He saved me and took me out of that. So I was, in a sense, the fat, the chaleb of that portion that he wanted. Because he saw something from the inside, the galbanum. Even on the outside, I was black and ugly to him. I was dirty. I had been in the ditch with the pigs. I had been muddied up with sin, scars and ugliness about me. But yet he saw that holy that portion of me that was something of value to him that he says, this is my portion. I want this. And so that's what he's trying to show us in these pictures of these fragrances. So it brings him joy when you confess your sins to him. It brings him great joy when we can admit that we're wrong. When we can finally realize that we're filthy rags, we're undeserving. We only deserve his grace and mercy. There's nothing more we can do. We walk in Torah because we want to be obedient sons and daughters to him, right? We don't do it because we think we get any more righteous or any more holy by doing it, right? We understand that, don't we? Uh, Certainly it is an act and behavior that you have to walk in. It is. But I want you to know that he still considers this his chaleb. It is that fat portion of his. Of course, it doesn't give us a license to go out and sin. We now know as believers how to behave and that we consider this something of great importance. And when you think about your own walk with him, I know there's times when Mark when he was working in regular job, he would come in from work and you could tell he had been around unclean people all day. It wasn't him saying anything, but just you could tell there was a heaviness, a yuckiness about when you've been around the world all day and gets on you, wears you down. And so he's trying to clean us up, <laughs> get us to that place where we shine up good and we can go into his presence now. <laughs> now, the last fragrance is frankincense. And this is the fourth and final ingredient, one that we've all heard about. Frankincense is very popular. And this, too, is a gum resin. It is pure white. It is grown in the Himalayas all the way to the Arabian Peninsula. And it is something that I mentioned to you a while back that the Tampa Tribune had a story in a newspaper in 2006 concerning frankincense that there would probably, this would be the last generation because the trees have been bled dry. They, they are piercing the tree and this extract and gum is oozing out. And the reason is because of its popularity and how it's being used so frequently now that that there's a number of believers as well as new agers and so on that are using it. And they're saying that it's not producing seedlings. It takes 40 years for the tree to mature in order to give forth this gum resin. So they're saying this is the last generation for the frankincense. Isn't that interesting, folks? Because after Babylon falls in Revelation, it says these will be no more. So there is going to be an end to these fragrances. We're not going to see them forever until all things are restored. Now, the Hebrew word levana, which means white, pure, or white light. The levana zakai alludes to Yah's love for his people through which he, it says, whitens and bleaches their sins. The mevlevin whitens or bleaches their sins. So again, it's a picture of how he's cleansing us. You see, when you're in his presence, he's washing you, right? He's, he's cleansing you. You're confessing your sins, and you're coming into his presence with pure thoughts. That the word that he's washing us with and uh, cleansing us, that our thought life and our deeds will match that of his, you see. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I know James 4, 8 is a convicting book when you read that. Because it tells you, you're supposed to count it all joy when you face the many trials and tribulations. For the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and patience, amen, so that he can complete his perfect work in you. And so now he's telling us that we've got to take authority of these thoughts and deeds that come before us. And when we're in his presence, 
to know this, that we are to bring forth the word, declare the word of your situation. Don't say what you got, say what you want. Amen. Concerning the word, because the word's been spoken, the word has gone forth from his mouth. It will not return empty. So we are to cast down evil imaginations, hold every thought captive, right? To the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ in second Corinthians 10, five. I say this scripture all the time because they're out there. Their thoughts are swirling about they're out there. And you're going to just say something that you wish you hadn't said concerning your situation, because the enemy would like to convince you that it's useless. And there's, there's no point in you praying. You're wasting your time. This see, you know, your prayers aren't reaching past the ceiling. I mean, the devil will like to convince you of that, but that's certainly not the case because he tells you that he will be there with you. And so with all of these ingredients that are mixed together, they produce something that is very pleasant and pleasing to our heavenly father. He considers it a holy thing. And so as the priest of Israel gathered these ingredients, which were crushed to a powder, weighed out, measured, mixed together, and then they would milk them into a large substance together to mold it back into like a brick or a block, which they could transport and says that Exodus 30 verse 36, and thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. Now, this is not a strange fire that you're bringing to him because this is the way he prescribed it. This is what he considers a holy thing. And so the high priest would chip a portion or a small piece off of that block and crush it to powder and place it upon the hot fire or the coals in order for it to burn. And it would release the fragrance. And so it is with our prayers that when we pray, we can't cover everything. We can't possibly get it all in. Needless to say, you shouldn't. You should not present your whole grocery list of items to Yahweh. You should work it out. Work out some details. Because when you pray specifically, you will get specific answers. Do it in a broad brush paint. God bless me. That's what you're going to get. A broad brush answer. Because you're not going to know if he answered you or not. Because you didn't, you didn't pray specifically enough. So you got to work it out to the fine detail. We can't pray about everything. We can chip off a little bit each day, crush it to powder by getting it down to the fine detail. David specifically prayed concerning going in. Mark, where was that scripture regarding the time when David prayed about, he said to go into the, oh, I'm uh, Samuel. And he prayed about going in. Will you give me favor? Will I win if I do this? He said, do it. And then he prayed again. He didn't take it for granted and say, well, it worked the first time. I'm going to do it again. No, he went back to the father. And he said, should I go in and do it? He said, no, 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 don't do it. Do do, do, do it. Do it a different way this time. Remember? And what did he say? He gave him a little more detail about that time. He says, went in through the trees because the brushing of the trees sent a sound across the way and tricked the enemy. And they were able to take back, right? So God is telling us something here. We need to pray specifically for events, for individuals, for our needs, for our health, well-being, for others. And, and that it's not going to be meaningless statements. And each fragrance, when you use these, you pray with these. You don't just use the fragrance as, oh, I need this galbanum because I got this little thing over here. No, you pray when you use that galbanum. You pray when you use your anika. You pray when you use these fragrances because of what they are a picture of. And so when we see our lives on a large annual scale, like when you go to Yom Kippur, you know, you're overviewing the whole big picture, but it is with the tiny pieces throughout the day. The essence of life is a whole bunch of circumstances that brought you to this point. You see? So that bad one, that bad experience you may have had, it's just as important as the good ones because they are, it's the element, the mixed portion, if you will, that brought you to this point. So we can't just say, well, I'd like to undo that one and not have that a part of my life. But it is a part and it's an ingredient. Maybe it doesn't smell so good to you, but to Yahweh, when you come back around to that point when you can repent, especially at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, these important feast states, we can look back over the whole year and see the fullness of how he brought us to this point. And even now in my own walk with him, I was telling Mark, I says, you know, I was teaching when I was 19 years old, standing up doing a rock music seminar. I had no idea I was going to be at this point. 
I didn't plan it. I didn't think, oh, I think I want to be a speaker when I grow up. You know what I mean? It was just one of those. I start looking back, and I see flashes of the future. They were prophetic little milestones, if you will, bringing me to this point. When you get lost at sea or confused about, where am I supposed to be doing? Well, you know, because people are always searching, where's their part in the ministry? Go back over, look back, look back 20 years. See, what, what was he doing with you then? Because that's where he's bringing you to now. It's a good thing. And so this incense it was burned perpetually day and night. Air prayer is the same, isn't it? To be praying in season and out of season, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, Romans 12, 12. And so this burning on the hot coals is going to bring about some fire, some tribulations in your life. And we all are very familiar with those. Amen. But that's when you're able to cry out to God. Right. As soon as it heats up, what's the first thing you do? Cry out to God. You want help. <laughs> so just as that heat of those coals releases the aroma of the incense, it's burning. Our prayers are like that in times of need. And he wants that. He desires that. Elohim turns that bitter experience into something sweet. It's teshuva. It's repentance. It's turning back. Amen. He's structuring your life and re putting things back together with all these raw ingredients he's given you and you're working these out. He's transforming you into that sweet fragrance that's pleasing to him. And so and it says in Exodus 30, verse six, and God is expecting you to be there to meet with thee. Amen. It's his desire to hear your prayer and he wants to respond. Proverbs 27 verse 9 says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. It is the incense that he's referring to. This brings him great joy. And the Torah states that this is the most powerful form of offerings because it has the power of life and death, just like we talked about concerning the matter of Korah. When they mishandled it, misused it, it brought death. But then it turned right around in number 16. When the people said, complained and said, You killed them! He said, Aaron, take fire and put it on the incense and run through the camp because a plague is broken out. That Lashon Hara against the leadership caused a plague to break out, leprosy and sickness and disease. And he says, run through the living and the dead and stop it. And he did. Now that is twofold. One, spiritually, the picture is stop complaining, stop murmuring because it's going to come back on you. It's a guarantee. God is not mocked. That which a man sows, that he will also reap. Two is that those oils stop the plague. And we know that from the teaching earlier on the healing properties of the oils themselves. But he says, make atonement, stop it, and then run through that camp. And that's what he did. And so he followed the instructions, and guess what? It stopped the plague. So it has the power of life and death. Now, they, Talmud Midrash just says that this was something that Yah had taught him through the angel of death, even at the Passover. This was a picture again. What stopped the plague from going into that home was they had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, but not just slap it up any way they want to. Moses said to the elders, use the branch of a hyssop to apply the blood. And it was, it was done in a proper way. So that's why I want to help refresh you in your memories of understanding that there is a proper way to do things. You see, you can get away with some things when you're little and young, but then when you get older, he says a little more expectation on our behavior. Now, let's look at this word concerning the incense in the acronym of the Keturit. It is, I don't, I'm sorry, my computer for some reason didn't have the Hebrew lettering, so I had to just sort of spell it out for you. The Kuf, Tet, the Resh, and the Tav. Now, the Kuf is, remember the picture of the letters each symbolize and means something. And it's behind the head or the last. In other words, he's got your back covered, right? <laughs> the kuf stands for the kadosha, the holiness, the kadosh, right? The tet stands for the tahara, the purity. The tet was the picture of the snake or the surrounding all around. And the resh, which is the head or the highest, stands for the rakamin or the mercy. Tav stands for tikva or hope. Or, and the tav is, of course, the covenant, the seal, the sign we know in the picture of this. So look at this. He's got your back. Amen. Who's got your back? 
the head, Yeshua. He's surrounding you with purity. He's got you covered, and you've got that covenant. You've got hope. Amen? I mean, that's the mikvah. The mikvah is that we immerse ourselves with hope that it is a transformation. I mean, we know that water can't change us, but it's by faith in the promise and what the word says that when we immerse ourselves, that we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are done away with. Behold, all things become new. We have a covenant. We're sealed. So we know he's got our back covered. Amen. <laughs> and so maybe you've been wondering why are these sweet fragrances or something more desirable? I was wondering, how come some of them are sort of pungent, odor, yucky, you know, earthy? I've gotten used to them now. Maybe once you've started to use them in your life and you get away from the cosmetic and the synthetic stuff, you, you get to it appreciate them more. But the Torah says in Leviticus 2.11, you may not burn any leaven or honey as a fire offering to Yahweh. And I thought about that. Well, we all know about leaven because of the Passover. We know that it's puffs up, right? And that's a sign of or a symbol of sin. Well, guess what? Honey too. Because if you place that on fire, it bubbles up. It says it actually bubbles up higher than any other liquid. So it's a picture again of pride. That you can't be bringing in your pride into the house when you're in the presence of Yah at the mercy seat of God. We have to come humbly before him. So pride is what prevents us for recognizing and returning into the true teshuvah, which is to humble ourselves, to lower ourselves to him. And so our incense is burnt on the altar with each of these ingredients that he gives us, that ability to have a well-balanced relationship with Elohim and it's by coming daily to his throne confessing our sins with sincere repentance and that this is what's going to lead us the purification of our thought life and our actions are going to follow your actions follow your thoughts a man who may be tempted by adultery or porn on the internet he doesn't just go and do it he thinks about it he entertains those thoughts before he makes that step I'm just giving that as an example that our life has to be pure up here in order for the action to follow it. And so we can pray effectively for a physical and spiritual well-being and expect that and expect that because it is his desire. Our prayer will be answered because it says confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much in James 5.16. And so the Torah gives us instruction. And this was something that the Midrash had as well, saying that this is what is going to bind us in the connection to God that elevates us. It's very common in New Age that they burn incense because they, it elevates them to a divine status in their minds. But uh, we see in uh, Zohar 3.11 that it does not have that power to elevate and to bind us to our spiritual root. And so that's really what we all desire. When we come before God with our prayers to burn our incense, it is a daily thing. It is something we should do in the morning and in the evening. Even in the, the heat of the trials, we should pray so that we can rest assured and know confidently that our prayers have been heard and he considers them precious to him. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> God bless you guys.